Zelman here from windshrank.com. On this video, I'm bringing you the third day of the fourth week of the Dark Horse Training Program with Brian Olsrud. Like usual, I'll leave links below where I uh, put Brian Olsrud's video explaining and outlining the program, so you can watch that to get more information about the program if you'd like to do it yourself. As well as that, I'll leave links to the Lift Vault website where they've actually put together a free spreadsheet that outlines the program and actually has taken out all the hard work, so you can just do the program at home, plug in the numbers, and away you go. You don't have to fiddle around with Google Sheets or Excel. I know how much fun that is. So today is the third day uh, of the first week back after the break. So we're doing uh, lower body uh, deadlift and squats. Uh, we started off with some simple conditioning, four rounds of kettlebell swings and jumps, nothing fancy. Keep it really simple. Keep that under 10 minutes. Uh, we'll move on to the more interesting stuff. Uh, the main movements for today, I picked lunges and pause deadlift. So the program subscribes some other, prescribed some other movements there for the leg movement. Uh, I didn't have access to the equipment, so I just plugged in some lunges in order to get some single leg work. I haven't done single leg work in quite a while, not my favorite thing to do. But again, usually when it's not your favorite thing to do, that's probably something that you should be doing and it's probably highlighting a weakness of yours. Just because we tend to favor our strong suits and obviously not favor the things that we're not good at. We always like to do the things that we're better at, but that's just human nature, isn't it? So I start off with warm-ups. Uh, again, with the warm-ups, I like to start off really light, the bar weight, and then we pump up to 135 and we kind of make some incremental increases in the weight till we get to the working weights. Uh, today's max effort session involved four sets where we stuck with the five rep max for the uh, pause deadlifts. I opted to do uh, static lunges, so I wasn't walking up and down, uh, mainly because I don't have the space for that. And also I just wanted to use some dumbbells and focus on just getting that good form and not having to worry about whether the stance was correct each and every time. I like to vary the stance a little bit, so I opt for either a longer stance or a, and a shorter stance for the start and the end, just so we get a little bit more training stimulus. And I haven't really been doing lunges for quite a while, so I just wanted to practice a couple of different variations of the lunge, well, a static lunge in this case, uh, just with some dumbbells, 30 pounds in each hand, so nothing crazy. We did, I did opt for some higher rep, uh, higher rep lunge work there, so we did 12, uh, set to 12 with a 30 pound dumbbell, nothing, again, nothing crazy, we're just kind of filling in. Uh, the first phase did involve front squats. I did want to involve, I didn't want to include some sort of quad dominant movement again. So instead of doing uh, double leg movements, we just opted for that single leg lunge uh, to opt to be the antagonist movement for the pause deadlifts. So now we move on to the main movement for today, which was pause deadlifts for a five rep max. Again, if you watch the video, you'll know that we play around with one, three, and five rep maxes for our max effort work and that uh, is just based on kind of how you're feeling. I'm just following along with the lift vault spreadsheet. They arbitrarily pick different rep maxes there, but you can go into the spreadsheet and change that. I haven't felt the need to, so I've just kind of stuck along with whatever they've uh, put in there, just because it's easiest to follow. If you do feel, uh, the underlying notion is that if you do feel like you need to uh, lower the intensity for today, obviously you go for the five rep max if you're not feeling as good. Uh, if you're feeling great for the workout leading up to it, go for that one rep max and see how you go. Nevertheless, today we did pause deadlifts of five reps. Uh, one of my more favorite accessory movements for the deadlift, I generally like to pause just below knee height. Top position just below knee height. I find that that's a good balance. Another great place to pause is an inch off the ground. That's really difficult. And again, depending on where you pause, uh, depends on what type of weight you can load into it. That's something I've noticed there. A one inch pause off the ground is a lot more difficult than say a pause mid thigh where you're almost at lockout. Let's so keep that in mind when you are doing your pause deadlift, pick the pause where you feel like you have a sticking point or where you feel the most difficult part of the lift. And obviously you're, a lot of people will find the floor the difficult part of the lift. Uh, but we, since we're not doing a deficit pause deadlift, we're playing from regular height deadlift. A pause anywhere below the knees is something I would recommend is quite helpful. Uh, just because most people have a difficulty below the knee, that's me personally. Once it goes, once the weight kind of gets above the knee, it's a lot easier to lock the weight out at that point. Once you've hit that knee, 
for, for my personal experience, the knee is then it's pretty much good to go unless your grip gives out. And that's a totally different story. But for the sake of working the muscles that aren't grip related for the deadlift, generally it is knees and below. And that's where you want to keep that pause. Uh, how long you pause as well is, is going to affect obviously how much weight you use and the outcomes. The longer the pause up until like two seconds is probably good. You probably don't need to hang out there for a minute. That's unnecessary uh, for this, for the training outcomes of this program. But if you do want to hang out there for a minute, by all means go for it. But I don't think that's productive in any way. And you'll probably be sticking with something like 135 pounds of really lightweight. That's not going to achieve anything. Uh, I generally like to do a one count pause just because it strikes that good balance. Ideally a two count is there, but I'll count to, I'll think of two, but realistically in the replays, it's going to be a one second, a one count pause, not even one second really. So that's another thing to keep in mind with your pause movements. Uh, if you can try and make it consistent, thousand, one thousand, two, one, two, whatever your counting metric rhythm is, do that for the entire set. So at least from week to week, you have some sort of cadence and some sort of familiarity and consistency with the amount of pause you're taking just so that the time frame is similar for every each and every pause. If I'm pausing for three seconds this week, then one second next week, then five seconds the next. There's no way to really compare progress. And I'm really not progressing along that because we are changing the very another variable in the way of the pause. So again, I like to pause just below the knee. I found that that's a nice little spot for me. Again, the pause deadlift is one of those accessory movements I'm really a fan of because you are increasing the difficulty without having to increase the amount of weight on the bar. And that's one thing, especially if you're trying to strive up with those uh, lighter weights. So up until five plates, I've just hit a five plate deadlift. So in my own personal experience, the Accessory movements I favored have been the ones that overload the movement, not necessarily the ones that overload the weight. So with that being said, something along the lines of pause, deadlifts, deficit, deadlift, snatch grip, deadlifts, things that increase the difficulty of the movement without having to worry about increasing the weight too much. And I found that that is a good way to increase my training stimulus by increasing the frequency of that movement whilst not having to put too much stress on the body. So I'm a big fan of the pause deadlift. We did 275, 295, 315, then a top set of 325 for five reps. I think that's a really great outcome. Again, that should help follow, that should help transition over to the full, so the regular deadlift, because we're increasing that time under tension and driving up some more uh, mechanical difficulties so that hopefully our body can overcome any sticking points that we had that we encounter along the way when we go for that heavy deadlift. And then we follow it up with some planks for 30 seconds and just and just burpees. Nothing crazy, nothing complex with the abs and conditioning, just simple, keep the blood pumping, keep the, the body moving. And from there, we move on to our volume work for the day. Uh, again, three sets were prescribed. I only hit two sets in an effort to keep the time of the workout down, something that I have been focusing on in the second phase. So we did Keep the, obviously the dumbbells the same, 30 pounds in each hand. I did drop down the reps to 10 reps a leg. And then the pause deadlifts, the prescribed reps were 10 because we did five reps and the prescribed weight was 255 pounds. I wasn't able to hit the 12 reps that I like to, the two reps over for the first AMRAP set. Uh, so we just did 10, 10 and 10. Uh, to keep that time frame down again. And it's something that I am working on. I am trying to keep an, a uh, vigilant eye on the clock during these workouts so that they don't drag on for more than 90 minutes. We're just wrapping up today with our dynamic effort squats. And again, another thing with the dynamic effort squats is I have been dropping the weight down with this start of this new phase. Uh, we did start to ramp up the weights during the last part of the first phase, but I did notice my tempo slowing down and the speed really wasn't there. So now focusing on speed and technique Without, I don't want to really increase the amount of weights I'm using until I know that my technique and my speed are dialed in because if we slow down the dynamic effort work, it, it removes the dynamicness and explosiveness stimulus from the movement and we just revert over to some volume work, which isn't really the training stimulus we're trying to accomplish. We're really trying to drive up some explosive gains and practicing that dynamic explosive movement is, is another skill that you have to do much like a heavy single is practicing that speed and that fast movement is something you really need to work out and something that I haven't 
been focusing on in the first phase, I noticed after looking back at some of the videos. But nevertheless, we did hit 205 pounds for uh, the full set. We were able to finish the full set of 10 today on the Imam, 205 with some pink bands at the top. So of my middle weight elastic bands that I have access to. But it took us 11 minutes overall. I did stretch out the, the rest periods towards the end there. Again, it's not something I like to do, but just with the way that this workout is going, it's the way the program is going, just the intensity of it. I'm having to dial back that rest. I'm having to dial up that rest period during those EMOM sets just because that's just how it has to, that's just my conditioning level right now. And again, it's something I'm working on. Again, when you do start a training program, when you are doing a training program, look at your skill level. You might not be at the level where the program requires you to be, but obviously it's building you up to be able to do that. So we're always building and trying to be better than we were yesterday. So overall, the workout took an hour and 23 minutes. So scraped in right under the 90 minute mark. Really happy with that. I can, now that I am focusing on keeping that time frame down, I do see a somewhat downward trend in the the three workouts that I've done so far. So I do like to keep an eye on the clock and I am going to start just cutting the workout short if my, if I'm lagging too long, just because I don't want to, I don't want that to become a regular thing. And I do want to just give some advice with picking your accessory movements, especially with me trying to do some lunges. I wasn't a big fan of single leg movements for the last couple of years, but I am starting to realize that it is something that will be beneficial for me in the future and in the long run, working on that single sided uh, work will help remove some muscle imbalances and just bring back some uh, symmetry to my training. Just because when you do load the barbell up and you are doing everything in the regular conventional fashion with two sides, you do tend to develop strength imbalances on one side or the other. How big of an effect that has or how detrimental that is to your health, uh, who's to say what that is. But personally, for my own personal preferences, I do want to go back to how I was before where I could uh, a couple of years back when it was uh, something that I did focus on, I was able to do heavy pistol squats, something I can't really do now. So I want to work back towards that. And I think this is a good step in the right direction, doing some lunges, trying to load that up in the future so that we do drive some single leg work, which I think is quite important, especially if you're not, not necessarily for, for, for pure powerlifting purposes, because obviously powerlifters, everything is a both sided movement. No one's doing single leg squatting for the heaviest amount of weight on the platform, doing squat bench deadlift with both of your limbs at the same time. So not necessarily for powerlifting, but I think for general health and general uh, mobility, I think doing incorporating some single sided training is probably going to be helpful for you just as that overall balance of strength and health rather than having such a single-minded focus on developing the squat bench deadlifts in their conventional fashion. With that being said, again, like I said before, when you pick your accessory lifts, try and focus on your weaknesses. And it's going to be hard to look back and really be honest with yourself and do things that you really dislike doing. So one of the things I really dislike doing is front squats. And that's the movement that I did for my accessory movement for the third day for the first phase. I really dislike front squats. I don't know why, for whatever reason, it's just not my my favorite squat variation. So because of that, I make an effort to plug in the front squat whenever I can. And I'll generally always include it into a training program when possible and just cycle it out halfway through if the, if the program calls for a change in movements just so that I don't get burnt out on them. But it is something that I know that I need to work on because it does train uh, my abs and my quads, something, especially my abs, it is a very good movement to to ramp up that static ab strength, especially under load. And again, that goes for single leg movement, something that I've neglected in the last couple of months, if not last year, is not doing any single leg movements, any heavy single leg movements. So things like Bulgarian split squats, lunges, walking lunges, pistol squats, things of that nature where we can really, again, it's, it's ironic that I like to do accessory movements that increase difficulty without increasing weight doing single leg 
single-sided movements are one way to really drive up the difficulty without having to use as much weight. So for example, with a single leg squat, I can't load up 200 pounds on the barbell and do a single leg squat. With talking more of like the heaviest I ever did with a single leg squat was 45 pounds. So that's that huge disparity there. So by working on single leg movements, we're able to really increase that difficulty without having to increase that weight. So that overall tonnage that we're exposing the body to isn't as great. That way we can focus on just getting more training stimulus and improving our body's ability to recover because we're not stressing the body out too much. And especially with a program like this, I'm really trying to focus on balancing that stress out, which is why I think part of the brilliance of it is that you do have to keep an eye on the rest periods. And by keeping an eye on the rest periods, it does temper the amount of weight that you can and that you can use because by keeping the rest period short, it's almost self-limiting to you can't push out as heavy weights as you could if you had, say, a 10-minute break in between each set. Even if they are giant sets, by shortening down the rest periods in between each giant set, you are driving down the amount of weight you can use because your body has to be able to recover from the weights in between each set, and you're only giving yourself a minute to 90 seconds of rest in between. There's only so much you can recover from unless you're a, a beast of an athlete, in which case it's the perfect program for you. And your body's already adapted to lifting heavy weights with very minimal rest in between. Something to think about for your own training. And I think that'll be just great for your own personal strength development and just being able to bring up the overall picture of strength. Like usual, I'll leave a playlist here so you can catch up on the rest of the Dark Horse training program, see how my training has been progressing and how it will progress in the future. And obviously my overall review and rating of the Dark Horse training program. This has been Selwyn from Winstrength, and remember, a better life through strength.